so uh, we are going to be connecting. We are all actually, uh, you know, in some ways connecting literature and disability in different ways, all of us who are here. So, uh, for example, there is Chitra and there is Tarun, right? And uh, I, I'm wondering whether I thought that there would be some kind of an introduction, uh, but maybe you can sort of also speak, perhaps. So I assumed that we would be introduced, but uh, Anita, of course, as the cliche goes, Anita needs no introduction as a very well-known author. And uh, here is Nidhi, right? Now, I, in, instead of uh, me kind of you know, delving into your uh, what you do, I would rather that you from, f start from there. Now, Tarun, I have also sent questions in advance since he is nonverbal uh, with autism, just like Elizabeth. So uh, he always would prefer the keyboard. And so it's always better to have questions in advance. So Chitra, uh, are they going to, is it going to be projected out there or through that? And then they'll, they'll see it, right? So f for a start, Chitra, I mean, I, I suppose kind of briefly, right? Your personal experience with the disability and uh, also about talking fingers. So which is a collection of uh, essays written by persons with, who are non-speaking and autistic, right? And uh, uh, Anita has written a children's book. She writes novels galore and poems, right? But in this children's book of hers called Bipatu and a Very Big Dream, there are characters who are introduced. It's not, uh, you know, she's not putting the focus on disability, but incidentally, there happens to be a character who has CP, cerebral palsy, someone else uh, who is blind, right? Now, N Nidhi here, on the other hand, has uh, this wonderful publishing house called Bukosmia, the smell of books. And there again, there are, uh, she deals with topics such as disability. So I think there's no better way to, uh, you know, uh, get people interested in disability than through fiction, in fact. So this is the way in which books and uh, you know, children and literature and disability are all connected. So I'm wondering who to start with. Uh, Anita, I'll tell you what, I'll start with you. Because Bipatu is a character. Now I want to know the origin of Bipatu, all right? Now in, she and I are both Malus. So we know that in Kerala, Patuma is a very common name. It's a corruption of Fatima. So children, but here there is a B Patu, right? So how, how what was the inspiration behind that? Uh, in, in my part of uh, Kerala, uh, B Patu is a common name, common oh, Muslim yeah. name. In including the B. Yeah, B yeah, B Patu. Um, it, it'll be like B Patuma, that kind of thing. Oh. So I, I don't know if it is because they do, you know, the, the words are not spoken right, but now it's a, it's an old fashioned name, but it used to be a, you know, a fairly common name. Okay, because the, uh, uh, in our part of the state, because we know how dialects differ, Patuma is what, yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah, way, yeah. Patuma B, you know. Uh, and uh, Nidhi, you started uh, the smell of books. Can, can you hear? And uh, I do know that I've read Not That Different. This is a comic book explaining disability to non-disabled children, yes, right? That's right? And there's also a lovely story, an adventure story called Extra, right? Extra stands for the extra chromosome, and it features among, uh, in a family, a child with uh, Down syndrome, right? And it's wonderfully written by uh, Archana Mohan. Mentored Archana by Shivani. Okay, no. <laughs> not there. <laughs> okay, so it's it's something that's so readable and uh, you know it captures you, and so there again, like in Anita's book, the uh, disability is incidental. For example, there's Madama, again another funny name, <laughs> being a Malu, you know, <laughs> Madama is a white woman really, <laughs> Saip and Madama, <laughs> so she, and she happens to be blind. So a way of introducing disability to children, right? How, how important is that really? And why do you think of including disability in your portfolio of sure. publishing? 
So Bookosmia, which means the smell of books, is a publisher for kids by kids. We started off um, with a very firm belief that all young people, as early from 16 to 17 year olds, um, they're very capable of expressing themselves and very deserving to be heard by everybody. Very often we dismiss young voices saying you lack experience, you do not have what it takes to write or express yourself. So Book Osmia caters to everybody over the last few years, we've kind of grown, we now publish children every single day um, from 150 plus locations, thousands in a year. And as we did that, I think uh, my whole team was very convinced about the power that young people bring. Uh, while we may discard them saying you don't have experience, but I think it's a lot of that conditioning that they don't have that is their advantage. So um, the reason why kids, and we're asked that very often, is because I think children are um, naturally curious, they have unfiltered questions, and they don't settle for an answer which is, you know, very euphemistic. You, they're not looking for metaphors, they want clear answers, and that's the only way to understand a subject. Um, they're very free of conditioning and judgment which catches on as you grow older. And uh, we feel that the only way to naturally be inclusive is when you grow up over the years. Firo spoke about it being a slow process. You can't expect someone in their 30s to suddenly turn on a switch and say, I'm going to do, I'm going to hire neurodiverse people. If you've never thought of inclusion before, you never grew around with children in school and college. And with the instance of um, disability and diversity being as high as it is, um, you're 100% likely to cross paths with someone like that. And I think children have the time and the mind space to care about it. Yeah. So that's why we focus on children. So Chitra, coming to you. Uh, yeah. Well, OK. Please, please feel free to clap in between. Why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> uh, is your mic working, Chitra? So uh, of, of course. For you, it's a very personal experience, you know, first-hand experience with uh, being a caregiver, disability, etc. And I've also asked Tarun a question, uh, but I think I'll start with you talking about your experience with Tarun, and then perhaps we could have uh, this uh, question that I asked Tarun, and me being a journalist, in 100 words, Tarun, tell us the highlights of your experience as an autistic, non-speaking student in a mainstream school. So that answer will come later, once we've had, uh, yeah. you know, Chitra talking to us about it. Thank you, uh, Meena ma'am, and thank you everybody for being here to listen to us. Uh, so my experience, as Nidhi pointed, was like, literally like turning on the switch when we got a diagnosis with Tarun. And uh, we were lost. We were really lost because we hadn't experienced disability before that. But yeah, along the way, we've learned a lot of lessons and we've met a lot of wonderful people. And that is where my whole belief comes from that inclusion is not very difficult. It's just about changing mindsets. So our experience has been pretty good and he's attended a regular school as Meena Ma'am pointed out. And that has not been a very tough experience for us. Uh, contrary to what most parents of children with autism face. So the experience has been a huge learning uh, path also for us. And I always tell that uh, Tarun's diagnosis actually liberated us to be who we are because we are otherwise all caught up in the rat race and in those uh, narrow blinkers that we put on to survive in society. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so Tarun says this, uh, education is the opportunity to learn new things in a safe and happy environment. To naturally learn, highly important is having powerful teachers. My differences made my schooling experience very different and unique. Perhaps a lot of good people made it much better than most other boys of my capacity, but still not perfect. Personally, both meeting my friends, classmates, and nice teachers, as well as the opportunity to learn, were the happiest. They brought many melodious little moments into my life. There was a lot of good support for certain things, but not so much for others. Most academic things had the total freedom that only necessary things I wanted or felt had that capacity to do, I could choose to do. 
However, the help that I needed to build nice friendships was not enough. Since I completely speak in typing, answering questions together with a slow pace of typing can make it really difficult. I had classmates who supported me significantly, so my experience was were nice, quite nice. Many teachers believed that my abilities did not match how most people saw me. Including me, understandably, took a lot of patience and caring for me, and the teachers gave their thought and time for my participation fully. Some good opportunities to share my abilities with my school and classmates included participating in annual day programs and science exhibitions, one where I presented on the connection between two of my favorite things, math and music. One of the assembly programs that I particularly cherish is of playing the song, We Shall Overcome, on the keyboard to contribute to my class's school assembly program. I was also part of every sports day program and every field trip that my classmates were part of. The education system fails the disabled population time and again. Just imagining how good the support must be because of how phony the inclusion in schools and society often is. The experience really shapes the person you become, which usually guides your thinking. My experience has greatly influenced the person I have grown into, the person sharing his thoughts with all here. Thank you. Now, Anita, I'm wondering if it's a coincidence or uh, that it's women. Now, <laughs> uh, do you know of uh, disability in fiction written by men, even children's books or whatever, or what do you think that might be? What do you think um, the genesis of that is, is one if at all? book, in fact, I was thinking yeah. about it, uh, Firdus Kanga, uh -huh. he wrote a book, Trying to Grow. He had brittle bone disease, and uh, I think he moved to Cambridge or Oxford, I don't know. And he lives, he used to, I mean, he was living there and he wrote this book. It was about living with brittle bone disease and how he dealt with it while living in Bombay and then eventually moving to the UK. That is one book. There's another book I've read called by this, I think I mentioned it once, by R.C. Hutchinson. It's called A Child uh, Possessed. Um, it's about uh, a child we, in that, because it was probably written in the 50s, they're not very specific about what the child's uh, problem was. Um, but you know, I probably think maybe the child had uh, uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, probably, I don't know. Right. He doesn't ever mention it. But it's basically about a father and daughter. And uh, he drives a truck through the Alps. And he has to take this child with him everywhere. And how initially in the, you know, in the hotels that he goes to, or the diners and those kind of places that he would go to, the child would be regarded um, as, a, as a freak. And then how slowly he also starts seeing the child like that and and then but slowly there is a bond that comes between the father and daughter where he then finally sees her as just a child and no more than that you know and i think that's kind of crucial because it's also the story of um a, a, a caregiver's journey because i think yes on the one hand there is the child's story but there's also, I'm sure that several of the caregivers here would know that it isn't an easy task. You know, initially there is this um, denial, there is resistance, there is this question, why me? But then there is a point where I think where all, all the caregivers get into this point of becoming heroic people because they say this is how it is and we're going to try and make the best of it. So I think this is like also uh, a great salute to all the caregivers here. Yes, yes. Totally. Uh -huh. uh, now, uh, oh yeah, it's there. Okay. Uh, I did ask Tarun, uh, how important is it for children to read stories with disabled characters? Because, Anita, we are also talking fiction. And I think, you know, it's not just nonfiction, even Pridoskanga's trying to grow. 
Right. It is written as it a novel. A, written as a novel. Novel. Okay. 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 Only later, Fiction. when you read the bi autobio, right. yeah. you know that you know that he it's himself. His story. Right. Yeah. Because I think that power yeah. you can't deny. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, so I did ask him, uh, "What are your favorite books featuring characters with disabilities, and how important is it for children to read stories with, you know, disabled characters?" Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, somebody just scroll up. Yeah. So he. Uh, he's actually made maximum use of this opportunity and he's written quite a lot. Lovely. So, uh, it often is the only opportunity to learn and understand about disability. Maybe even interact or observe somebody with disability, even if it is virtually. The exposure alone gives children the opportunity for hearing from people with different living experiences. This becomes the ground to grow the forest of an inclusive society on. Children do hear a lot more open-mindedly. This makes it a lot more easier to mold the minds of new learners, building inclusive thinking skill skills in them. It brings more opportunities to specially back needs of us disabled to reach our true potential. Speaking specifically regarding autistic people, it is often just the invisible nature of our difficulties that makes the difference striking. Making people also know more about our struggles is challenging and even boring because of it being invisible to anyone who is non-autistic. Here, if autistic characters are introduced to children, it would not be difficult to have an understanding about us autistics and their inclusion. So the favorite books, uh, in my jo reading journey, important learning has been that people get to see and experience closely the lives of disabled people only from characters in stories. Though I have come across characters who are disabled, I have particularly liked Christopher from The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. I could closely relate to his struggles as an autistic person myself. He likes routines and gets anxious in situations that have heavy sensory inputs. The difficulty he experiences after going to the tube station in London, finally finding the space to feel relaxed till the station crowd lessened was very similar to the experiences I have had at railway stations and airports. The close relationship he has with his mother is also similar to mine with both my parents. Like me, Christopher also loves math which I found interesting. Another book he's mentioned is about Greta's story, the schoolgirl who went on strike to save the planet. And the book really had me hooked for how focused Greta was on getting the message about climate change and its consequences strongly to people associated with taking the decisions that can impact our future on this planet. Mm. Her commitment to the cause she believes in was inspiring. Also being a nature lover myself, it felt great that people were doing their bit. To remain focused on the things you believe in, such that together with hard work, great change becomes reality. I've also enjoyed movies, Life Animated and Wonder, haven't read the books yet though. Burfi, I love the music a lot, especially like the character of Jilmil, who's so clear and focused in her thinking, though she needs so much support in her life. I sometimes have the desire to read more and discuss about books, but my mind-body disconnect does not give me the full freedom to enjoy this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Chitra, I think this would be a good time to tell the audience if they have any questions which they would like yeah. him to answer. Maybe a couple, one or two yeah. maybe. They could uh, write it on a piece of paper. One of the volunteers can, uh, you know, pick up the paper and then uh, we'll yeah. leave him for a while till... Yeah, we, should we, we would, he would need some of, time Obviously, he would write. need time. So time to type it in. So, so, yeah. if uh, so that's why I... If anybody would like to ask. Yeah. yeah. So you. if anyone has a, a question or two briefly to tell him, uh, who's the volunteer who would go around? Somebody? Yeah. So you can just uh, raise your hand and then they'll probably write the question on a piece of paper. Bring it onto the stage to Chitra and uh, uh, Tarun. And meanwhile, we'll just sort of, you know, continue our chat here. Okay, so uh, talking of, well, change, I mean, that's a big word, no? About can books cause change? 
you know, uh, whether it is, I mean, we are talking fiction here again, right? And as you very well know, Anita, we don't sort of uh, write fiction saying, this is my purpose. Otherwise, we'd be writing a manifesto, right? But uh, how is it that through characters, through fiction, through fictional stories, which could be inspired by uh, your own experiences, of course, right? That is where fiction comes from anyway, from the self. But uh, how far do you think, or, or have you had, for example, I, I'll come to both of you while, you know, I hope some questions are coming there. Uh, how, you know, uh, have you sort of experienced that kind of an incident maybe where someone has read it and then sort of said something, responded maybe to Archana's book, responded to your book and said, well, you know, now it's opened my eyes, you know, that sort of a thing. Has it happened? And do you think that will happen through fiction, through stories? Um, so I'd like to start off by saying that, you know, Bipatu was written because uh, I have a friend who has a son who has cerebral palsy. And uh, this boy and his younger brother, so Saad and Ayan, they'd come to visit me and we spent some time together. And there were two things that struck me. One, how um, uh, Saad was so determined to be part of everything we were doing. And he, he was demanding to be included, you know? And, and that was wonderful, I thought. And I thought, I need to write about this. And also, I was very struck by how the younger brother, Ayan, was so protective of his older brother and making sure that he wasn't, you know, kind of leading him by the hand, but he was making sure that if I didn't understand something that Saad said, that I understood, you know? So he was being the caregiver there. And that struck me and I was like, I have to write about these two children. And that is how this book was born. The character of Madama, when I started writing it, now Feroz knows and a few people know that I have a very severe vision issue, okay? And uh, just when I was writing it, I was going in for um, eye surgery and I didn't know what was going to happen, whether I would have vision in both my eyes or would, would I have vision in just one eye. Um, so at that point, um, you know, I kind of located myself in this character called Madama. And I started asking myself, how was I, because you see, I write, I'm a writer, and this is, and I need to see things to be able to observe and write about it. So I, I started asking myself, how do I, how do I live my life if I can't see? But then I would think about Saad, and I'd think that he was managing to live his life very well, with, despite the neurodiverse disorder he had. So I think in many ways, this is a very uh, significant book for me um, because it was inspired and it was also trying to understand how, if, uh, how I, I would live with my disability. I, I have vision in one eye, I don't have vision in the other eye. So that is how I live. Thank you, Anita. And uh, Nidhi? So I would like to probably take a slightly um, broader look as to the power of stories and how they can bring about change. And I talk from experience as a publisher publishing for young people. So very often we look at a book and we think this is someone else's idea, it's boxed in this format, I read it, that's the end of it. But that is not true. Stories are all around us. They leak into our mindset, into our thinking in various ways. It could be in fiction, the characters that you like, you adore, you want to be. Parts of you that you feel like, I don't like this being like this because I don't aspire to it. Everything we do and um, we decide on, you know, from the choice of serials we buy to the votes we cast to who we want to be is an outcome of our taking to someone else's story. It necessarily doesn't have to be fantasy. It can be real, it can be a blog, it can be an essay. So it's very important to understand, one, the power of stories that they have, and secondly, who is telling them. I think for us, as we publish under the Not That Different label, um, we realize that very often the people who do not fit any stereotype of a writer, they may not have access to the best education to have a grasp on syntax, grammar, construct. 
um, they may not um, have a, uh, even, you know, like we published Aditi, um, who's a 17-year-old when she, we published her last year. Uh, she's a non-speaking uh, girl on the autism spectrum, but writing liberated her in very many ways. She chose to write a book about everyday stories. She did not write about autism. And when our young readers read it, and I'm going back to that question you asked, like what is people's response? So there was so much learning for a child. Um, people coming and saying, one, I clearly understood non-speaking doesn't mean non-thinking. We, we played out her messages, people read her books, they were blown over. Um, we had um, other kids saying, we realized that her singular identity is not autism. She chose to write about other things. She's not that different from me. She's writing about things that, you know, matter to me. And I think third is what you do with these stories. Now Aditi has won a literary award. I played her video at Stanford. People were blown away. She's speaking at the UN through text to speech. This is a child who um, her parents. When is that, uh, Nidhi? Has she already She's done already that? spoken. Really? She's now a regular speaker. Okay. So she doesn't fit Strange in. Strange that we haven't heard of her, no? This is the problem. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I think that perhaps is where we need to also put in more effort as a publisher to get the word out. It's not just enough saying, I'm publishing from you and you know you express yourself. But I could see how that turned around for Aditi. We published various people under our label and one of our book extra, and Shivani here who's a fellow is a mentor of the book, um, made sure that it's not an information booklet. Um, she worked with Arshna and uh, the writer of the book who herself is an award-winning author. But they were very clear when it comes to a young writer, they don't care how many awards you've won, they don't care who follows you on Instagram. If you write a story I like, I'm going to stick with it, it'll stick in my brain. So I think that's what we need when we want to change with the use of stories. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, Chitra, is there any progress being made or? Okay, slowly. But meanwhile, I was wondering whether uh, Tarun has already framed uh, a, an answer to, do you think children's books featuring the disabled will help change society? You have? Yeah. So uh, pro probably that can just be on the screen while he's framing his answers or what do you think? Yeah. Uh, the last bit? Uh, so I'll just read it out. Uh, yes, the change in society has to begin from children to e ensure that it sustains. For large trees to grow and for the forest to thrive, only possible if enough work has been put into the ground. With children's books featuring disabled, if it happens, it makes the ground gets re get ready for change. The, that books help create and shape perspectives is common knowledge. I'm sharing my poem named Books to share my thought. So this is a poem he had written some time back, Books. Reading shapes that mind more, a veritable book peeps within the core. Time moves birthing individual imagination, creating the long needed element of anticipation. You toast to the, that otherness with simple belief. Tomorrow really, understandably, change often only is a whiff. Amongst the many books read and countless stories fed, there dwells that which spells change. There lies forever a timeless dance of ideas, yes, the very essence of change. I suppose uh, it's okay, while we wait, we'll realize what it takes for a nonverbal person to communicate. It takes time. So actually, we're sort of seeing it playing out in front of our eyes, you know. The question has come, don't think that a response will come immediately. Process it, and then the process of responding, right, which he's doing slowly. 
So actually, the spell, uh, the what is that thing called, uh, Nidhi? The 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 spell thing which you point to, what is it called? Which Elizabeth uses? Which Tarun is text to speech thing, right? Yeah. But the keyboard, the keyboard, yeah. I think, uh, ma'am, while we're waiting for Tarun to respond, I'd yeah. like to add that he writes beautifully. We've published Tarun. Um, uh -huh. I'd encourage people to go and Google and look up for Inclusion Fest. His writing is brilliant. Um, you would not even imagine the kind of metaphorical flow that the whole story has. Okay. Um, and what so is this Inclusion Fest? Um, so the Inclusion Fest is something that we run at Not That Different every year, where we publish um, young children every single day who uh, have a neurodiverse condition. And that's the idea that you see more of it and you learn so much just by seeing instead of someone telling us. But yeah, Tarun has brilliant writing out there. And we do have books um, by other self-advocates. We have um, Extra, which I mentioned earlier on Down syndrome, autism. And this is the book by Aditi that I was talking about. Oh, Small Stories, Big Thoughts. Yes. Okay. Beautiful book. They're all out there. Do pick it up. Um, okay. Pick them up for your kids. Yeah. Anita, I don't think it's, you're going to make it a habit to have persons with disabilities in your stories. I do know that you write for children, of course, not just for adults like us. But, uh, uh, you know, has it kind of got into your head now, this whole idea of inclusion? Um, yeah, so in fact, uh, one of the things about writing this book was the, you were asking about the response. I, began with the inspiration, I didn't finish the question, was basically that um, I've been meeting uh, children and parents uh, who've been telling me how happy they are that there is a book like this, which normalizes in, to some extent that, you know, people are different. Each person is very different in their own way. And uh, there is a societal construct that says this is normal and this is not normal. but Children don't see it like that. Children view it very differently. And so for them, it's just about, oh, is this, this is a particular condition? And that's fine, I know how to live with it. You know, that's the child thinking about it. And other children who say that it's fine, we know how to be with another child, right? So all the kind of um, biases that they have is a result of what they hear at home and probably outside and not their own thinking. So I think it's very important uh, as a writer, and I believe, I'd like to believe that I'm a responsible writer, that it's important to kind of make this very, very strongly uh, uh, felt among young readers that the society we live in is not homogeneous, right? That it is pl it's a plural society in many ways, whether it's in gender, uh, whether it's in, you know, abilities, whether it's in whatever, in religion, whatever it is, we are such a plural society that children ought to learn that, yes, there are, uh, there is a segment of the population who are different from who you are. That doesn't mean that they are any lesser. So they need to start learning that. And I, I think children's books is a great vehicle for that. Um, so it, just yeah. to fill in the time, yeah. I also want to talk about um, another story. And again, this was inspired by um, an encounter I had with uh, a mother and a son. Uh, I was on a flight with them and uh, the, the, the son had uh, Down syndrome and he was about uh, 38 years old. And there was his mother with him who was in her 70s. And we were, you know, sitting in the uh, same row. And after, uh, it was a long flight uh, to Calcutta from here. And so we started talking. And then the mother started telling me about, um, you know, this, this son of hers. And um, he was, you know, he was just so lovely because he was very concerned that I didn't have anything to eat and that he was eating and stuff like that. And uh, then we started talking. And then um, one of the things that she told me and which did hit me very hard um, is that 
she said, you know, I'm, uh, she was in her, uh, she was 78, and she said, I'm 78, and one of the things that really worries me the most is what's going to happen to him when I'm no longer here. And this is something, again, that, because it's a, it's a, it's a uh, question that most, most parents uh, think about, okay? They think about that, what's going to happen to my child when I'm not here? But when you know that your child needs a bit of uh, support from people around, then you wonder how is, how is this going to happen? So um, I wrote a story about that as well. And uh, this was about a mother and a son making that breakthrough finally when he turns 40. So she and he share the same birthday and she thinks that he's never going to know it's his birthday. I mean, it's her birthday. And then on, on the, the day of the birthday, the child, he's 40 years old, and he turns around and he looks at his mother and says, happy birthday. And that is like a huge breakthrough for her at that point. Yeah, so. <laughs> so do we have one answer ready now yes. to be read out? Yeah. Did you, did you want that? No, no, it's on. No, it's yeah. on. Uh, so the question that was asked was, uh, how do you incite systemic change for the neurodiverse and disabled person? Where do you start? So uh, Tarun has a, a thing of uh, saying a lot in few words. Okay. So And because it's such a forum, he's a little flustered also. He's just typed out by maybe simply listening to the neurodivergent. Absolutely. That's Perfect right. answer. Short and sweet. And <laughs> The second question was, why do we feel pain? All forms, physical, mental, perceptual. Mm. Because we are human. <laughs> That's it. Lovely. <laughs> so thank you so much, you know, Tarun, Chitra, Anita, Nidhi, uh, we, you know, for this uh, discussion. And thank you all audience. And I'm glad you did have some questions for Tarun to take part in. Thank you.